How do you differentiate between values and virtues? Because when I was reading the book, I kept thinking these to me sound like values and I'm a big value person. Like a lot of them in my coaching, I even ask people like, what are your top five values? Who do you say that you are or who do you aspire to be? But you make a little bit of a distinction in the book and I'm still a little confused on that. So how do you distinguish between those, those nuances? Yeah. So they're very closely tied together, but we use the term virtues when we're talking about the behaviors that we're bringing out uh, as as the individual actors ourselves. And we use the term values when we're observing someone else's actions. And so very often it's it's our own values that are evaluating our virtues, right? So, so they're closely related. You could think of one as kind of the giving end and one as the receiving end. You want your virtues and your behaviors to line up with your values and your perceptions. And so you can often use the terms interchangeably. We can talk about virtues that we observe cross-cultural uh, cross-culturally, you know, Martin Seligman has found like 24 virtues that every culture seems to value. And so that's kind of the relationship. You can use them the same, but uh, there is a kind of meaningful distinction once you get into the weeds. In your book too, you mentioned there was a part in the book and I underlined it. I don't know if I'm getting it right, but you said something about virtues being created by society, by your tribe, by the, like your environment can shape these virtues. Is that right? Am I getting kind of that right? Yeah. So what I've argued is that um, if you think about how certain organisms evolved, I mean, certain like if you look at the peacock, for example, uh, Darwin famously was really disturbed by the peacock's tail because initially his theory didn't really account for it. He was saying, you know, this huge elaborate tail on this peacock's back is like a target for predators. It's, you know, really costly to grow a tail like that. It takes more energy, right? It should be bad for survival. Why do peacocks have these beautiful, elaborate tails? And what he eventually pieced together is that, uh, you know, these are attractive in many ways because uh, they aren't good for fitness, because it takes a very fit peacock to be able to pull off a tail like that. And so it serves as a fitness indicator for mates. And as a result, it starts to be selected by mates. And so what I argue is that the reason why human virtues came about, even though they aren't visible in the same way as a peacock's tail, they're kind of like the elaborate plumage of our brains, right? These virtues like creative intelligence and generosity, they came about through a very similar mechanism. Uh, this is something that I you know, originally picked up from Jeffrey Miller, who's an evolutionary psychology, uh, psychologist, and I've kind of built on it. Uh, but essentially the reason why we value the things we do I think is because our social tribes have come to value these things and it becomes a selective fa uh, factor in our relationships. And so does that mean that we should uh, basically just turn ourselves into whatever people around us want us to be? Uh, I don't think so, because I think our brain has a built-in mechanism that evolved along with these virtues and values to evaluate us ourselves, to be constantly perceiving us even when the people around us aren't sending us clear signals. And as a result, I think we should be trying to prove our virtues to our own brains every day. We should be taking the actions that we would approve of, even if no one around us is watching, right? And this will turn us into the kind of person that we admire and, and will sort of bring about that deeper well-being over time. Yeah, and I was thinking, okay, if, if happiness is equated now to virtues, but then our environment, our tribe, our society shapes these virtues, like just our microcosm environment. Then I'm thinking, oh my God, what chance do we have, Ryan? Like, if, you know what I mean? Like, or, or <laughs> right. how do we, or how do we, or even better, if I'm reading your book and I'm like, okay, well, you know, I get that. Man, how do I get, what if the virtues in my environment that I'm being bombarded by daily are not good virtues? They're not virtuous at all. How do I realize that and step out of that? Have you seen any success in that or have you seen what people could do to get out of maybe 
I mean, I don't really, I guess there wouldn't be such a thing as, as it'd be an oxymoron to call it problematic virtues, but do you know what I mean? Where just the environment is shaping us not for success. Yeah, I, I think I think we could speak about proxy virtues. So we have things like uh, profitability that I don't think we evolved to value, right? There was no such thing as profit in our ancestors' world, but it's kind of what everything is centered around in society. So it's not a real virtue. It's kind of a fake virtue, but we get conditioned to value this more than we should. And so I think, uh, you know, this happens in varying degrees through every culture. Every culture kind of selects certain virtues and excludes the others. And, and I think um, despite what our cultures do and how they evolve over time, there is a common sort of universal core that can be found if we listen very carefully to our own deeper impulses. If we, I, I sometimes say, take a philosophical wrecking ball to your cultural beliefs and values and figure out what. St what keeps standing underneath it all? What are those core values that are deeper than that? And so I think in a lot of ways, it's about asking yourself the right questions. Um, like I, I developed a deck of introspection cards called Mindsight that's basically like 81 cards uh, meant to help you get to know yourself and shed some of the cultural baggage that you've inherited. And I think the more you introspect, the more you inquire about yourself and your philosophical views and your values, uh, the more clear of a view you get of who you actually should become as opposed to who your culture, your parents, your friends want you to become, because those are not always going to be the same thing. How do we distinguish between true admiration and, for example, the conditioning that we might have from society or from the way we were brought up and um, you know sometimes we have an understanding of what is good and what is bad based on what we knew since we were kids so is there a way to to distinguish between that uh, really i think uh, a big part of this is asking big questions exploring philosophy asking yourself questions about what you really believe and value. And, and in some cases, these will be difficult questions. They'll feel like a threat to your worldview. But ultimately, and Nietzsche, who's a big inspiration of this book, would have said the same thing. You need to take a philosophical wrecking ball to your current worldview, your beliefs, your values, and, and you have to see what remains standing once you've done that. And so um, a big part of this is just going in and questioning all this stuff and getting to a point where you have greater perspective about these things. Uh, you know, ph philosophy is in many ways like travel. When you travel and, and study a different culture that's very different from yours, it sort of hits you that, oh, things can be different. The way I've been brought up is not the only way to do things. And studying philosophy and, and introspecting is a way of basically realizing the same thing about your beliefs. The way I see the world is not the only way to see it. And you need to expose yourself to a lot of those different ways of seeing it in order to eventually feel comfortable saying, okay, this is what I really admire. This is what I really believe, not just what I've been told to. Of those human values that are universally accepted or admired across all cultures, how, how would you defend those if you met an alien who had a completely different perspective on reality and didn't have an understanding or give a rat's ass about human value. So how would you defend it? Which ones would you defend and how would you do that? That's a great question. I'll take it in a little bit different direction and that I really don't think I would have any basis for defending human values. I don't think they are objective in that sense. I don't think they apply to someone who doesn't have a human mind. And so there's really not much to say to that person. And you can take that in, you know, disturbing directions too. There are people in this world who are sort of like aliens and that their, their minds are uniquely different. We have psychopaths who, at the very least, don't have the same drives that, that the rest of us do. Uh, I'm not necessarily convinced they don't have the same values, particularly when we study them, but it does lead to some difficult questions. But ultimately, the reason why we need to act in alignment with our own values is not because they're objectively good, it's because they are subjectively good, it's because we're evaluating ourselves according to that. And even if we aren't necessarily conscious of it, our mind is constantly observing our own behavior and asking, well, do I approve of myself or not? Am I approvable or not? And I've argued there are 
deep sort of evolutionary reasons why our brain is constantly doing this. But I think it has huge implications for our well-being. I think being a person that you yourself don't approve of has, you know, huge psychological implications. It's the, it's the worst prison you can be in, essentially. So I think there are very real reasons why we should live according to our own values, but I don't think they apply to non-humans in the same way. You're sitting here with me. Defend the values that you think are useful for humans. Again, let's get to the end mm -hmm. state. What do we want to look like? What do we want to act like? Who do we want to be as a species? I think there's a, a pretty wide range and, and it's difficult to balance them all, but certainly we value pro-social ideals, things like kindness and, and fairness toward other human beings. I think that's one of the deepest, you know, most deeply embedded virtues that, that humans have. I think we also value things like ingenuity, creativity, and humor. These are often left out of accounts of what a virtue is, but I, I don't think it should. It's clear that we admire people who have these traits, who are charismatic or funny, creative. So uh, that's a big one. And, and that's al also a huge one for me. I'm, I personally value ingenuity very highly. If I'm not exercising my ingenuity, uh, I'm not really feeling like I'm in an optimal place in my life. You know, we also have things like discipline. You know, this is one of the reasons why I think uh, exercise is such an effective sort of prescription for someone who's depressed is that, you know, exercise is something you can pretty much do no matter what life circumstances you have. And it gives you evidence of your own discipline and, and traits like this. So I think, yeah, I think there's a just a really wide range of these virtues. And, you know, everyone has some that come more easily to them. I think uh, you can tell in pretty early age that you have some strength that comes naturally to you. And I think a lot of us forget about those and think about more practical considerations as we get older and wonder why our life circumstances that we have achieved aren't bringing us, you know, a deeper kind of satisfaction. And I think that's because we haven't integrated those virtues that we thrive at and that we value into our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Virtues are more uh, behavioral and values are more perceptual. When we observe someone else taking virtue behaviors, uh, we are evaluating them according to our values, right? Mm. So you use the analogy which really stuck me in the book that values are like a container and then virtues are what yeah. go into them. When you're evaluating something, you're looking for something to fill that container of, of your criteria, right? You're you're evaluating something and, and you need to observe some kind of behavior or virtue um, to correspond to that value. So I think calling it a container is, it's another way to think of it that could be helpful for some. But I also emphasize, you know, in, uh, in chapter five and six, I talk about the directionality and how, um, you know, your evaluation of yourself uh, is, is basically you using your values to examine your virtues. So it's doing the same thing that we do to evaluate others, but applied to yourself. So what's coming to mind is Nietzsche talks about uh, mass morality society and slave morality societies in the genealogy of morals and slave morality societies emphasizing more compassion, like, yeah, kind of softer traits like that, more socially oriented, uh, compassionate traits. Whereas the master cultures are more uh, warrior based and would, yeah, courage, strength, more the ancient Greek kind of values. Yeah. So, so Nietzsche is uh, further away from the kind of uh, naturalistic, like uh, universal view that I take. So Nietzsche was, you know, he talks about the genealogy of morals and says, basically, this is all uh, just something that cultures evolve because of different power dynamics and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, slave morality, he said, basically, this is just a, things like compassion are just a reaction to uh, to the oppressors. Uh, and so people who are oppressed uh, come to lift up these virtues. Mm. Um, and so I, I would say there's uh, there is sort of a cultural fluctuation. I think different cultures seem to put more emphasis on certain virtues. And in many cases, they are reacting to other cultures or past cultures or, or you know, many thinkers are reacting to the culture that they are a part of and saying something's missing here. And I think they often go too far to the other extreme and they completely dismiss certain virtues that very much are virtues. But um, 
you know, I think Nietzsche was overly critical of compassion. I guess I'm curious, do you see that as carving different elements out of a universal uh, value map or or is there an actual change and emergence of new values going on there? So, so here's my take on it. I think, first of all, there's uh, there's evolutionary evidence that we have today that uh, these past thinkers wouldn't have really had access to that suggests that there are certain things built into our minds, right? We can see that things like altruism, for example, uh, there's like three or four different evolutionary explanations for why this is the case and why we see it uh, throughout cultures is that, you know, all, there's really no cultures where they just don't look out for anyone but themselves. Uh, every culture seems to value uh, generosity towards at least other members in their tribes, if not uh, all of humanity. Um, it, the way I think about how these things change over time is that what's really changing is our worldviews and our beliefs. Uh, and, and that has a lot of impact on how our values are sort of expressed. So if you imagine, uh, you know, you're sitting on a bus or something and you hear one person saying some really cruel, demeaning things to another person, just really bullying them, uh, your first reaction is uh, n disapproval, right? You have this disgust that you feel. I, because I probably that, I like to pile on people when they're down and just, you know, right, like right. join in. You, know? <laughs> you can think about, um, you know, when I get into the Darwinian component, I talk about um, the, uh, you know, the, the peacock's tail, uh, which evolved through kind of a social sexual selection process. Mm. Um, the tail itself is like the virtue, right? It's the thing that has evolved to, uh, be appealing to others for some reason. Uh, and the sort of mate preferences that female peacocks have for certain types of tails, that's like the value. That's, that's essentially how we're evaluating others. Uh, and, and they co-evolved in peacocks brains uh or uh, bodies and brains and they co-evolved in our brains to have uh, both virtues and values in tandem and they kind of depend on one another uh, the virtues wouldn't exist if there was no uh, demand so to speak if we didn't uh, positively evaluate these traits there wouldn't be any selective pressure for them to have come about <laughs>